people might be too embarrassed I'm to ask. I'm nodding my head decisions. You are indeed. You're, you're nodding a little bit too much, I think, I think, I, I think in, in, in response to that. So, but <coughs> I suppose that I can, anybody who's been a parent knows that all children go through a point where the child asks nothing but why, why, you give an answer, why, why, why. And that's kind of my job within, within the politics podcast. I mean, the other thing is that, <coughs> excuse me, the other, the other thing is that all those fantastic new innovations, some of which you showed there on the screen, the video, the Daily Digest, and the podcast, they all form part of, a, of the new ways in which we're trying to think about what our relationship is with our audience as opposed to what we used to call our print readership. And one of the things it seemed to me over the last four years, I think it is now, of doing the podcast is, has been occasionally tussling with the question of, okay, this is audio, but it's on the internet. Does that just mean it's radio on the internet, or is it something different? And in my view, I think it has to be something different. We're quite well served by talk radio broadcasters uh, in, in, in Ireland already. So what, the, what a podcast needs to do, it seems to me, is to go deeper, to appeal to people who are interested in dealing with a specific issue in greater depth than they're able to get from mass market broadcasting. And also I think, and this is really important, to give people an insight into the day-to-day -day job that we do as journalists in the various fields, and perhaps to open up areas of those activities in ways that we didn't or maybe even weren't comfortable in doing previously. <coughs> so for me in the weekly podcast, what's fascinating for me is hearing from you guys who traipse along here all the time. We really need to build a tunnel underneath Trinity so you can get up and down to Kildare Street fast or up and down, up and down, up and down from, me from here to Leinster House all the time. And you spend hours and hours and hours in the company of various politicians trying to elicit nuggets of information. Fiak, who's going to be joining us up here in a couple of minutes, was up there tapping away on his, on his keyboard up until about 10 past six on a story, I think, something to do with Michael D. Higgins and the, and, and, and the presidency. And you're working away all the time. And I find that fascinating. And the idea for me is to bring that level of knowledge and breadth and engagement with the subject to the listener in the form of a podcast. So that's I, I think we've done it because we have a, we have really good figures now on the podcast. They really they, they give me a lot of pleasure. And I know today the ABC readership is out for the newspaper and driven by digital subscriptions, we're actually seeing we're seeing numbers go up for the first time in a long time for the Irish Times, which I think is great news. Okay, thank you. And for the rest of the evening, uh, the only thing that will come out of Hugh's mouth is why. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, absolutely. excuse as well. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to you at this stage, who is going to uh, present the podcast with our three uh, invited guests, plus our, our deputy political editor, uh, Fiat Kelly. And after that, there will be about 15 minutes uh, uh, to allow questions and contributions from the audience. Yep. Well done, Harry. <laughs> if I could call our guests onto the stage, they are Josepha Madigan, who's the Minister for Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht. Louise O'Reilly is Sinn Féin's spokesperson for health, and Thomas Byrne is Fianna Fáil's spokesperson for education, and also our deputy political editor, Fia Kelly. Please join me on the stage. <laughs> While we're doing that, I should also say there are a number of uh, national politicians in the audience too, and we'll bring the lights up at some point and try and bring some of them into this conversation uh, after a few minutes also. Come on up and take a seat there. I think uh, our producer was saying, boy, girl, boy, girl. So there we go. Josefa, you want to sit over here? Great. You're all very welcome. Um, we have quite an array of political talent here, Felix, so I'm going to start by asking you a question. We are, we are presented here with uh, representatives of the three biggest political parties in the country. They, uh, if we are to believe current opinion polls, they uh, uh, command the support of perhaps 80% or so of the population. Um, why can't they get along better? Um, I suppose they do in a way, but they just pretend they don't. You know, Com Thomas's party is in a conference supply agreement, Josephus' party, and they kind of fight over differences amongst themselves time and again, but they have a, a document which outlines shared policy positions and what a current government governing arrangement is based on, but there is a degree more of testiness coming into that mix now, I suppose. Thomas won't thank me for saying this, but Louise is the only person on this panel who has the, the luxury of being an outright opposition and op op opposing the government on all its measures. Thomas is constraining what he can say a lot of the time because the, the, the natural <laughs> question is, the na he will disagree with me, but oftentimes when the natural question is, Thomas will oppose matters, but if it gets to too serious a point, the question is, okay, why don't you cut and run on that issue? So I suppose, go ahead. 
Go ahead, Tom. See, yeah. that's Please feel free, by the way, to cut, cut across each other. You know, that, that goes into the whole reason for going into the conference and supply agreement. I mean, look, we, we wanted Michal Martin to be elected Taoiseach. With, I, I seconded his proposal three times in the Dáil. We didn't succeed, so we had to go into the conference and supply, or else we would have election after election after election. So by, by asking that question every time there's an issue, why don't you cut and run? The answer is, well, the reason we went into a, a conference and supply agreement is that we didn't believe that the country's interests were served by anybody cutting and running mm. uh, every time there was an issue. A and there are problems there and there are disagreements, and we have an agreement there for three years, and clearly it's not a shared policy platform. It's, uh, it's, a, Fianna F it's a list of Fianna Fáil well policy uh, preferences uh, that we have asked, you know, the government, have uh, Fine Gael have agreed to implement because we are operating the conference and supply. So it's not a shared policy platform well in any way. They, have they may have adopted uh, some uh, of them. It commits, for example, that public resource expenditure to be for one basis between spending increases and tax cuts. And that is a change from the what the Fine Gael position would be, and that's that was one of the fundamental issues in the general election in terms of the, the, the issue of tax cuts versus public service. Well, so then you do agree. Louise. You've, you've agreed. <laughs> you've agreed to that. And it, it strikes me some days that, uh, that there aren't really any fundamental differences between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael that are discernible. Um, and yet when you say there are differences, you know, when, when we point out that there aren't any differences, you know, we, uh, we're told, no, no, we fundamentally disagree. And yet you vote together. Uh, you have negotiations together. You agree the budget. And then afterwards, you give out about the budget. And the question is not asked, why don't you cut and run? The question very often that's asked is, why did that not come up when you were negotiating the budget? Why, 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 when there are the policy differences that you refer to, why are they not thrashed out when the budget is being negotiated? Josepha, the Taoiseach was incredibly uh, full of praise for Fianna Fáil's Minister for Finance this week. He seems to be doing a fantastic job. Yeah, I mean, uh, just first of all to say that I, I think that it's important you know, when you're talking about new politics, and, and I actually I agree with Thomas about this, um, I, w I was involved you see, you see. for <laughs> once. Um, I, I was involved in the government negotiations. Gone, it's nearly two years ago. I think it's it's two years on the on the twenty seventh uh, or the twenty sixth of February. Uh, was it was the election date, and then we had you know seventy days of negotiations, well and it was really difficult to get it over the line. Yeah, um, and and it, you know I think in a sense Thomas is right. There was no choice but to, but to engage in this conference and supply, and otherwise otherwise we were back to the electorate. Obviously, there are differences of, of public policy, differences of opinion in many different facets. But if you also look at in, in Dáil Éireann, uh, at Leinster, in Leinster House, in, on the Oireachtas Committee, so you can see cross-party and how it works there, even on, on the um, uh, Repeal the Eighth Committee and uh, other, other committees, the, the Health Committee that Hildegard was on, uh, Deputy Nocton here today, and, and things like that, they do work, and reports are, are you know, given and produced after that, so it's, it is very important, but, you know, and, and it may well be in the next elections that there's another confidence in supply, but in whatever form that but is. But is it the case, is it the case, Pierre, that I was reading Stephen Collins's Thursday column um, today, and he says, and I quote him here, the real surprise is how closely aligned the Fine Gael-led government has become with Sinn Féin. That has led to growing speculation about the previously unthinkable, a coalition between those two parties after the next election. Is that still unthinkable? Uh, I don't think it's unthinkable, but I think it's less likely than uh, I would foresee a Fianna Fáil Sinn Féin coalition, neither of which I think will happen after the next election because of the stated policy position I'm of the party leader, which, Thomas away. which Thomas is Thomas about shif away. shifting yeah. restlessly. Where I've, which <laughs> I've just said that it, it ain't going to happen. After the next election, mm. it won't happen. Probably not. But because the stated position leader. But I think the fact that you have seen an alignment between the, uh, the, the Fine Gael positioning on Northern Ireland and you know, the quite ostensibly nationalist tone of the Taoiseach's dealing on Brexit. Like, do you remember that pre-Christmas pre press conference where he said to the nationalists of Northern Ireland, you will never be left behind again. And I think the probably the most obvious manifestation of that, and probably where Stephen picked up the theme for his column when I saw other people writing about it over the weekend, was I was struck last week in leaders' questions, uh, when Thursday questions, when Taoiseach was away and people deputised. Simon Coveney was taking uh, questions for the government, Pierce Doherty was uh, taking questions in the absence of Mary Lou MacDonald, and he stood up, and the topic was the North, and he praised Simon Coveney and his officials for the efforts they had gone to in the talks, and then both Simon Coveney and Pierce Doherty decided to round on Michal Martin for criticising the manner in which the governments, both governments, British and Irish, had approached the Northern talks, which is 
pretty unprecedented. It's, sure a the last it's a turn up for the books, Josepha, isn't it? No, I mean, I think giving praise and praise is due in terms of helping, wi you know, accelerate talks or bring talks to a, a fru fruitious outcome, if you like, is radically different than going into government no, 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 with, with a party where your policy pieces are diametrically what opposed. What I was struck by, in the last all, we saw a couple of occasions. One was instances over Maria, uh, con controversy over Maria Cahill, and various instances when Jerry Adams passed and the IRA passed came back to become a, an issue of concern that week. And it was almost like an unspoken thing that Enda Kenny would stand up and say, this is a disgrace, and you have questions to answer, and Michal Martin would stand up. And almost unprompted, there was like an understanding between the two of them. They were both round on Sinn Féin in the chamber, and leaders' questions were turned to criticism of Sinn Féin. What we saw last week was leaders' questions turned to criticism that, that of that Fianna Fáil by Fine Gael and Sinn Féin. Yeah, there's definitely a change in that. Just to say, we, we will not, Fine Gael will never be going into government with mm. Sinn Féin um, for, for, for many different yeah. reasons. I know... Uh, Deputy Byrne is saying the same thing, um, but that's a matter for yourself. I'm not going to speak on that. But I think there's more of a chance of Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin, um, uh, hopefully not for a very long time, if ever. Um, but certainly Fianna Gael won't be. Um, they're the same two, two parties too, too many that, are, that are trying to insist uh, that the... And, you know, rightly so, because we've actually... Uh, we've been working extremely hard to do this, but to try to insist that we form a government in the North. I think a lot of this stuff... And I'm sure it's popular with their bases, by the way. I say, uh, and it's possibly uh, popular for a few silly wee sound bites. But at the end of the day, it's not, uh, it's, it's, while it is not something that I would relish, uh, neither is it something that I could see. In the immediate aftermath of the next election, uh, Sinn Féin will act on whatever mandate we have. We will seek to put together. Uh, a Republican government, a government that is true to the ideas of equality and integrity and respect and all of the things that, uh, that the party stands for. And then it will be as everything is. Uh, it, it'll be a matter for the people. It'll be a matter for the mandate that we get. So I don't, I'm sure it, it, it's popular and, and you know, but it's but easy the to point say. Is, the point but is I don't that your think party it's necessarily your, your, your productive Your party has changed its position very dramatically in the last two years. In fact, I think it was Mary Lou MacDonald in our podcast bit so who yes it was. gave the first indication of that or just... And that now you're in a situation where you're looking at these two parties in a different light because you are you are much more set on getting into government to pursue your your objectives. So it almost certainly you'll have to be dealing with representatives of one of the two parties here. Well, what we will be they doing be. immediately following the the next election is acting on the mandate that we're given. The same as all political parties uh, will be acting on the mandate that they're given. I mean, what is most likely as a result, I suppose, given the high levels of cooperation and friendliness and the uh, no apparent policy differences between them is a Fianna Fáil Fine Gael coalition if that, uh, if, if that is dictated by the numbers or indeed another uh, confidence and supply agreement. Can I, can I just say, I mean, before the last election, uh, one of the big issues was the Labour Party and the promises that they made, you know, the five ones that they made that were all broken and that became a major issue in the political sphere. So any commitments that we made then and make now we really have to consider, can we do this? Are we going to do it? Is this something we can deliver to the electorate? The electorate are cynical about the promises that were made. And w two of the key promises we made before the last election was that we wouldn't go into government with Fine Gael and we wouldn't go into government with Sinn Féin. Now, there was massive pressure, including, I think, from an editorial in the Irish Times, if not more than one editorial in the Irish Times, for us to go into coalition to do this in the national interest. The Taoiseach of the country at the time went on national television with a big open offer to Fianna Fáil. Uh, joint Taoiseach was even mentioned our rotating teacher was even mentioned sometime. But we felt that the promise that we gave uh, was, se was, was so serious, and the electorate took it seriously, that we had to keep it, and we would keep it because it's what we wanted to do. So I think we've shown then that we will keep those promises. We're saying now, at the same time, we're not going into coalition with Sinn Féin. If we, if we said we're going into coalition with Sinn Féin, like, what's... It's so it's that policy won't change. Will change. Will will not change. change. No, no, no. That's what... That's but what but but if, you, if you as a party, yeah. if you as a party are selling yourself short before an election to say we're going to go into coalition with X other party, then the, the electorate might as well vote for the other party. So we, we're putting forward a distinctive identity, a distinctive policy uh, platform that has been shown uh, to be put into practice as part of the confidence of supply to the best of our abilities in terms of the mandate that we have in the Dáil. You know, I think we've, we've given people, as Jim O'Callaghan famously said, value for their vote. 
and we want to get into government, we want to put that alternative, because the reality is we are the only alternative. Uh, just, uh, I'll come to, to you in a sec, but just, to, just to put you on that, Thomas, the policy will remain the same in the next election. Fianna Fáil will emphatically rule out coalition with going into government with either Fine Gael or Sinn Féin. It's already been ruled out, yeah. And rather than rehashing everything that happened the last time, and regardless of uh, Irish Times editorials the last time... I mean, we they we respect all views on this, but is we had our own view on it. To go back to my very, to 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 my very first point, if you, you, we have three parties here that represent 80% of the electorate, and one of them is saying it will absolutely not enter into any government uh, relationship with the other two, and I think I heard you say the word never in relation to, in relation to Sinn Féin, Josipa. Yeah, well, is, I mean is, is, is that... I absolutely hear what you're saying, the same but is that really doing a good, the best service to the Irish electorate? To provide yes, the, 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 the same but questions were asked before the last election. Can nobody can nobody envisaged the conference of supply. And what we're doing in terms of serving our, the electorate, and not just our electorate, I think Sinn Féin sometimes slip into this, mm -hmm. our mandate. Our, our mandate really, and every TD's mandate is everybody in your constituency who's been elected by the constituency, is to get the policies implemented that we have so put forward. So confidence in supply is a better delivery of policies no, to the Irish no, people not, well than, it, it's than a majority government. Well, so so certainly, if you don't mind, I just want to say something. In terms of, when I say never with Sinn Féin, I absolutely categorically mean never. And I know that's the Fine Gael's position. And um, one, one of the it's reasons for that is Sinn Féin, for example, their alternative <laughs> budget w w would add two billion, basically, to, 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 the, to the tax bill for the average taxpayer out there. They're talking about something like 3% on uh, change the capital ac acquisitions tax. I, it would be an average of 13% more if you're going to take on the, an employee. Sinn Féin's policies are anti-business. Um, they, they're also a Eurosceptic uh, sort of party, and yet uh, they're anti-Brexit, even though they could have actually joined the uh, re registered as a party for the UK electoral um it's to campaign on it and they didn't that they've um, moved to so the center quite a lot in terms of those, those Yeah I mean they're cozying up the you know there, there, there is a cozying up there to, to Fianna Fáil and, and certainly we Mary Lou ha has made it very clear their new we leader previously that, that uh, she would be open to being a junior coalition partner um and you know it, it's certainly something I mean Chris Andrews le left and went to Sinn Féin and uh, we had joint statements from Sheena Fe Sinn Féin deputies and Fianna Fáil when? deputies when uh, there was a, it was in relation to actually my particular Psychic. sector before I was minister the minister for culture uh, up in up in um, the northwest and I'll give you the details sorry, about if that you're talking about the if well if you're talking about a cross party forum uh, on uh, Moore Street that was I'm established not by your predecessor Fianna Fáil and and Thomas That's is right on one operation. thing in that we did offer a full partnership to Fianna Fáil during the, the, the government negotiations uh, to come in with Fianna Gael because at the end of the day, this is about serving the, the Irish people and putting in uh, a proper government. The confidence in supply, which is almost two years, has largely worked to date and I think has surprised people. And I see no reason for that not to continue into the next well into the next majority term. government? Yeah, I do. I, I think as a minority it would work quite well. Yeah, the confidence and supply agreement, uh, it's not really delivering now if you're living in a hotel room, Josepha, you know that if you're stuck in emergency accommodation. I also know there's m more money. We, we actually exceeded our targets of last year. tens of uh, thousands of people are going to spend more than 24 hours on a trolley. It's not delivering for those people. I don't know who it's delivering for. And, and, you know, maybe those people are very happy, maybe outside of my constituency clinics, maybe outside of the people who approach me on a daily basis looking for help. Maybe there is a, a cadre of people do that I'm completely do you unaware do you of do you who not are doing cartwheels about the conflict of supply that, agreement, example, but I don't see levels, it. That employment levels have increased no, significantly in the last well, three or four years. Well, as a former trade union organiser, I can that. tell you the type of employment uh, that we are seeing more and more of actually in this state is of precarious employment. We have seen that coming in. I, before I was elected, uh, I represented Louise people in the education the sector, the session, an area of where we never would have thought we'd see precarious employment. And you have lecturers, you have tutors, and they are on if and when required contracts, practically zero hour contracts. So it's the quality and the type of jobs really that, uh, that I think we have to look at. Fiuk, are we gonna have an election this year and are these the kind of issues that it's gonna be fought on? Um, I'm not sure this year, probably between autumn this year and spring of next year, there, there will be an election. Nobody has yet answered the question, how does this conference supply deal end? Um, so Micheál Martin says it's not going, it ends at the budget, we have a review of the budget and we want delivery as on issues of health and housing. The Taoiseach says we have to talk about this deal ending before the budget because you can't have it fall off the cliff. So I think what's going to be really interesting to watch is if you from the Fine Gael side in particular, because Michal Martin's position is 
the deal says a review after the third budget, that is our position, we're sticking to it. If you see Fine Gael kind of picking fights, as it were, not just even might disagree with me, but so the Taoiseach has said, we need to negotiate this before the budget. And then the kind of vibes from around government are they want to go to Michal Martin after the referendum on the 8th and say, you know, let's time, it's time to talk about this. Let's extend this deal. It's working quite well. You know, let's we don't want this to fall apart. And then it's anticipated that Michal Martin will say, no, we don't want to talk about it yet. And then Fine Gael may attempt to roll into the budget negotiation. So what's the point in talking about a budget if you can't talk about another confidence supply agreement? And if you see Fine Gael knowing full well that Fianna Fáil will push back against that, and say, you know, that's, that's not what we agreed. And then there's a kind of a, a natural break where perhaps Fine Gael go, this isn't working for us, let's go before a budget, or I could say, let's get this budget out of the way and let's go to the country after that. Nobody has quite answered what actually happens when this ends. So that's what, a very interesting what, what, idea, what happens? What how happens? how, does it, how uh, is it going to be continued? Because yeah. I know there's going to be a review at the end of it. So I, I don't know what matrix it is uh, that Fianna Fáil are going to use, if it's housing and health, if it's something else. Clearly, it, you know, there's no delivery in those areas for homeless people. The so, thing is so, so Thomas, the budget... But I'm just wondering if it is, if it does live up to yeah. the standards. So, so and Thomas, Thomas the budget is very clear that Fianna Fáil policies supply. are being implemented. The budget is agreed under confidence supply, and it's, you know, and it's presented to the Dáil, and the uh, various legislation is passed through in November into December. What happens then? Is it just you start from square one again? Well, the position is that we did agree to do three budgets. People said that we would cut and run at the earliest possible opportunity. We didn't cut and run, and I've outlined the reasons for that earlier, uh, despite lots of provocation, lots of reasons that have to be said at different times. Um, there were the agreement provides for a review, so uh, I've no doubt there will be a review at that time. But what we after see is... After the budget. Yeah, yeah, after the three budgets. But what we so see there is, is a lot a of there's a lot of games been played at the moment in the media. Oh, we'll, we'll bring Fianna Fáil in and... Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We'll provoke them into an election. Like we won't be provoked. We'll do what's in the best interest of, 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 of the country. But do you have to um, and there's the key no, there's thing. There's no, there's no the key thing for us is the key, for this the, key thing, the key thing is delivery. And you know, this government has great at plans. And, and my own um, education spokesman, Richard Bruton, is yeah, he's and great we for are plans. The plans. And lots of announcements every week from Richard Bruton. And look at what's been implemented. Not, not a huge amount of money, not been resourced. Whatever Fianna Fáil's fault, we have been shown to be able to deliver capital infrastructure in this country. And I think that's what's badly needed at the moment in terms of housing, if you think about in that. terms of transport. I think the ambition here is ambition, it's plans. We haven't seen the delivery on this. We've seen Metro North announced for nobody, the nobody, nobody, nobody. But if you're not seeing delivery, then no. what's the purpose of the confidence and supply agreement? You were two minutes ago, Thomas, you were saying that the confidence and supply agreement uh, was in fact Fianna Fáil policies in action, that it was your top line policies or whatever. And now you're saying it's not delivering and they're, they're not adhering to agreement. I'm, I'm genuinely confused as to what is going to happen at the end well of it when the evaluation is done. I, I, I see that actually my own personal opinion is that the confidence and supply will continue. I mean, the, the two parties, there isn't a difference the really the between them. So I, I can see I it actually I think continuing. it's important to state as well, Hugh, that you know, I at Christmas we got a resounding no election plea, you know, just before Christmas. I mean, it was very, very clear from the electorate, from every single constituency, well, absolutely well cross party. We certainly didn't want so that on the 21st you know, of December. I, I, non I did not get that in media, <laughs> so I have to say. Non part, well, well I, I, you must be the only person. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, because there are lots of my constituents uh, who tell me they didn't want an election before Christmas. Just finish. Just finish. If I can finish. just finish. Sorry, if I can just finish. From a non partisan perspective, it was very clear nobody wanted an election. I don't see any good reason to have an election un un unless something radically changes. But you're quite correct in that the, the negotiations in order to extend the confidence and supply will need, ne will need to commence um, before the summer, I would imagine, uh, if, 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 if it's going to be done See, this is the game. So this is part of the strategy. It's, it's designed to do things that we're not prepared See, to do and we're not going to be drawn into. They're, they're, they're both scared witness of being blamed for an election. Both of them are scared witless Look, of being blamed. We have an actual development plan, Project 2040, that we want. They both know that one has to happen sometime in the next That's year. That's the thing. Elections always happen. It's just a question but of when. nobody you know? wants to be blamed for it. Nobody wants to be blamed for it. I don't think media wants to be blamed for it either. It's actually through a session at Thomas's Ordesh by, I know, Tim Bale has given occasional advice to Fianna Fáil about, you know, how do you resurrect yourself from the Dawes of the 2011. And he said... good advice. What? He gave good advice. Yeah. Project's still completed, I'd say, is there? Yet to be completed. But he said, like he said, the big, he, the big lesson he was kind of drawing lessons from British politics. One was, you know, the Brexit referendum and the eighth, and you know, don't be caught on the wrong side of that argument, blah blah. The other one was 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 don't be blamed for the calling of an election. 
kind of used the example of Theresa May last year calling an election for what was seen as opportunistic reason, reasons, and I think both parties but, but know there has to be one. But they're trying to box each other into. Does that mean the then that you end up with some kind of absurd political version of you know those slow bicycle races they have in the Olympics, where they're kind of both wobbling, trying to stay on, and <laughs> trying to see who's going to go for it first and therefore lose. Pretty much, and I, fi I, fi I find it. I find in this environment, we've just heard Josie to say that you know we should talk before the summer. Thomas say absolutely no way. If that's the spirit in which both parties enter into budgetary negotiations, no, but it's but it's hang on a second. When there's three billion to spend, yeah, like that is going to be we really, we really we broad. we talk all the time. I mean, I've worked closely with Mary Mitchell O'Connor on the Technology Universities Bill, and Mary Mitchell gets a lot of uh, hassle from the media or from from critics. But actually, on this one, she's actually delivered something. Now, with it, without Fianna Fáil uh, coming on board with it and in difficult situations, she wouldn't be able to do it. But we have talked about it. But I've never mentioned an election so to we her. Can so we work can together. But you, you, you know, Michael McGrath's meeting Pascal Donahue. Thomas, there's you no you election you being discussed. You guys are going to have your collection conventions rattled off now in about a month or two. It'll all be done. I think Fine Gael had all of theirs done, I think, before the yeah, and and December so election. So and they're on TV so it's putting it's up it's posters it's and everything. It's like, you know, everybody's ready to go, but nobody wants to No, that. but I, I don't, th I don't think that's Politicians are always ready to I go. Th I think like being I mean prepared doesn't mean that... that I, I, yeah. Politicians yeah. are always I, I, ready for an election. They, so they can happen at the drop no. of a hat. Like, you know? can, so I, can I just say, from, from my perspective, I'm not... I'm not afraid of a uh, general election. I think I, I'd quite, I'd quite welcome it actually. Um, but I think the two people sitting beside me, it's not that they sound like they're terrified of being blamed for an election. They sound like they're terrified of the prospect of an election, actually. Can and I think we saw that just before Christmas. I think we saw, I that I think we saw Fall, the panic. Fianna Fáil candidate and TD in 2011, I'll never be terrified of another election in my life. <laughs> that's <laughs> a fair point, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> a fair that's point. That's <laughs> if you speak to people of Thomas's vintage in uh, Fianna Fáil, no, they are like, I've seen it all, I've seen it all. There's nothing more I can see. Yeah, who, sh who should be most, if not most terrified of an election, who should be most optimistic about an election? Is the Varadkar bump a temporary thing? Or is um, there something else going on there? You know, I'm going to be horribly neutral on this and say I think we do, do, do need to see a few more polls before it settles. The, he, uh, he absolutely got a bump after Brexit. We had an opinion poll uh, the week after the Brexit deal, which sh showed Fine Gael on 36%. And, you know, you'd want to see Fine Gael people that week. They were cock or hoop. And I initially thought it was a temporary blip, but that hasn't subsided. We've had a subsequent poll since then. It showed a small drop in support of Fine Gael, but still well ahead. Other polls have borne that out. Against that, I do think, and the Fianna Fáil argument Thomas will probably make, is that you know our internal polls show us in the late 20s, them on the low 30s. I do think the road to gain seats at is easier for Fianna Fáil on a constituency because level. Of the, because of what's happening in the constituencies or yeah. the opportunities like, Let's take Dublin for an example. Yeah. Fianna Gael had a really good election in Dublin the last time by comparison to the rest of the country. You kind of look around Dublin and go, where are the seat gains for Fianna Gael in Dublin? Possibly Josepha's constituency where herself and Neil Richmond will be running. It's a big ask for Neil Richmond to join Josepha, but it's not impossible. Who, whose seat will he be taking? Uh, I don't it's know. It's a three-seater, really Hugh. Yes, yeah. I'm but not aware I, I, of that. I would be very well confident of, of getting <laughs> two seats for Fianna Gael in, in Dublin Town. We've Shane Ross um, and myself and, 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 yeah. and Ian in particular. Then so, then so hopefully we will. Yeah, Fianna Fáil will be pushing very we, strongly. With the Project 2040 yeah, now, we have a lot of work to do yeah, with Fianna Gael. We, we have a lot of implementation you, you that go we want you go, you go around to do. Let's say Dublin is always, Dublin, the Great Dublin area is always a cockpit of election. Go around Dublin. There's currently three Fine Gael seats in Dun Leary because we had two plus uh, former Fianna Gael, so Sean Barrett. There's one, and you would have to say mm. the Fianna Fáil will get a seat, probably Mary Hannafin. Mm. They have big hopes in Dublin Central, which is going from a three to a four, Mary Fitzpatrick. Dublin Northwest is going to be a battle royale between Noel Rock and Paul McAuliffe. Possibly mm. a second seat in Fingal for uh, Fianna Fáil with Lorraine Clifford Lee. There are various ways you can see Fianna Fáil bring up the level of seats they have. Mm. I think the route is slightly more difficult for Fine Gael. Let's go around the country, you think Fine Gael, they have to get a seat in Tipperary, they really have to get their act there down there. They have There's to recover no in Munster generally. Yeah, they have to recover they? in yeah. Munster yeah. generally. So I still think it'll be tight. I've always thought it will be tight and it will come down to a handful of about 10 constituencies where there'll be a couple of hundred votes between it. And I don't think when it comes down to it, there will be that much between well, can the I two. Can I just say to you, sorry, we've sure been talking about an election hmm. since since I got elected, <laughs> which is nearly two years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. That's oh, oh, it is, but it's almost, uh, you know, every week. So th th it's not, it's not, in my view, imminent, um, you know, and it shouldn't be no. something that's imminent un unless it's, it's abssolutely necessary for the country. And I'm not saying that yeah. because of my position. How much and I'm not afraid of an well election how much either. Does it affect because uh, uh, ultimately we, we, want to, we want to implement the, how much the Project it 2040. It, 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 if unscrupulous people like Fiac start ramping up the pressure, you know, because there's, there's fights going on in the Dáil and Miriam's been scathing about whatever's happening on a particular day. Does 
does a, a kind of a dynamic start taking place, Louise? Do you think? Do you think? Does it does an election become more likely just because of those kind of dynamics going on, re regardless of any particular? Well, I think we saw in the run up to Christmas, uh, we saw ourselves come very very close to uh, a general election. Um, I have to say, you know, I mean, I, I was. Nobody was uh, was looking forward to uh, competing with carol singers, but I think if it had to happen, then you know we were we were ready for it and we were going to go. And I mean, you know, Thomas said that like he he, he was through twenty eleven, he was going to go and do it if we had to. Um, I don't think that the the media will necessarily force an election. Um, I do think though issues around the renegotiation of the confidence and supply could potentially. Um, I don't see any massive policy differences between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael that they would necessarily split on. Um, I, and I said this uh, in the Dáil during the week, you know, I mean, it's lovely to see the letting on rows between them, but in truth, there's very little, um, you know, there's very little that divides them. So I, with the two of them sticking very close to each other and the two of them saying very resolutely, and, you know, I would say nearly panicky, uh, you know, we don't want an election, we don't want an election. Obviously, it becomes less likely because the, the confidence and supply agreements will ensure that there, that there isn't one. But the confidence and supply agreement runs out in, uh, in a couple of months' time. And I suppose maybe around that time, then we'll see, and, uh, and we'll and see what about further Shane speculation. With a new leader, the general perception has been that there's been a lid on how far Sinn Féin can go with Gerry Adams as leader. Do you anticipate a Mary Lou bump to, to parallel the Leo bump? Gary Adams took our party quite far, actually. But uh, you asked me about our new leader. Um, there was, uh, and I think Vic, you were there in uh, the RDS uh, when um, Mary Lou was, was was nominated, proposed, and all the rest of it. There was fantastic buzz around, uh, you know, getting a new leader. I think Leo Bradford actually referred to it, you know, about the um, what a privilege and what an honour it is and how delighted he could see that she was. And I think there's always a bounce around um, a new leader. Uh, I think that's, I mean, I'm, I'm not a political journalist, but I think it's generally accepted that there is. You know, you saw Mary Lou on the Late Late Show. She's an extremely popular, personable individual. She's also a very competent and capable politician. And she will be more than capable of uh, holding the government to account. And we do say, and I know Thomas is going to object to this, but we do say we lead the opposition purely and simply because there are clear differences between us and the government where they d I don't see them between, uh, between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. But I think you will see uh, an improvement um, for Sinn Féin. I think that's, that kind of naturally happens. But we are very lucky with the leader that we have. She is an exceptional politician. So yeah, where does she Sinn Féin win those leader. seats you were talking about? If you describe the situation vis-a-vis -vis a, a two-way battle between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, where does Sinn Féin I, go? I think you know, the expectations for Mary Lou MacDonald are probably somewhat limited. They're on, what is it, Louis, 23, 23 seats now? Um, it, they would be doing very well to put on an extra three or four. If they got to 30, they'd be in, in dreamland. I don't think it's going to happen. There actually are a few seats around the Midlands that you, you're going to have a fight to hold on to. I think Donegal would be one that you're going to have to sort out. Like you know, uh But I think you if you go around the country, you can see there will be constituencies where it will be close. And you know, those are the ones that will, uh, those are the ones that will ultimately decide to make it to the next stall. Uh, you know, be people watch the polls are, the polls say one thing. And then uh, as we saw with Brexit, uh, as we saw with, yeah. uh, you know, with the, the British general election, the polls aren't always accurate. Yeah. Um, in fact, less and less so the polls are, are well accurate you could, you and more and more. You, um, you know, there's, there's a massive difference in the result from the polls. Can I ask about but those polls marginal actually? and the small constituents, sure. I think, are the ones there's that will decide it. There's a question about it. Like I, I take opinion polling seriously. I, I, statistics is a science, so I'm not going to just dismiss opinion polls. But it is a fact that since the 2009 local and European elections that Fianna Fáil's position in national polls has consistently that's not true. been underestimated. That's not true. It is absolutely no, consistent. No, 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 no. The last, the last, the last Irish Times polls before the general election got Fianna Fáil spot on. Where the and M MRBI was the only polling company to track the Fine Gael drop and the Fianna Fáil increase. C consistently, I, I, you may say that for MRBI, consistently Red Sea have shown us lower than where we come. The Irish Times come back as far as the 2009 local elections. We were significantly below the RTE exit poll last time and the time before. So the Irish Times exit poll the last time had you bang on. Significantly below where we are. <laughs> <laughs> Good man, Fick. Good man, Fick. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. what we hear is that the polls are always <laughs> wrong, except when they're right. Except when they're right, yeah. <laughs> Just even. Whatever, whatever, whatever <laughs> polls say, and sometimes they're, 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 they're completely wrong and sometimes they're, 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 they're actually spot on, but sometimes, and this is the utmost respect to all the commentaries, whatever whatever area you're in, 
politicians can feel in a very visceral way what's actually happening uh, in, in terms of, of the zeitgeist, if you like, in terms of uh, where the wind is blowing. Um, we hear it from our constituents, we feel it, we talk to people. Um, so the polls aren't always right in that sense. And just in relation to, to, to Sinn Féin, just, and I, I do wish Mary Lou all the best in her position as the Taoiseach did in the door the other day, but you know, there can be a sort of a, a, a seductive veneer, if you like, or like a new mask is put on. It doesn't change the policy of, 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 of a Sinn Féin when there's a new they're leader. They're um, and, and that's important to say. They still want to get rid of the special the policy is decided I don't, by our I don't membership, don't Josepha, I don't think at, at, at all Ardesh, and that, that, that won't If I can just finish, um, I don't actually think there's going to be any upsurge in Sinn Féin votes uh, the uh, the at the next the election, when the the whenever that is, because... The, 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 you know, they're, as I said earlier, they're anti-business. Um, they're they're really uh, anti-European uh, yeah. as well. But the biggest, in many the ways. biggest problem, and, and, th and it would actually be an absolute disaster. For the biggest country. problem was, and they're not in power in Stormont. They're not in in, in power in Westminster. And um, I, I think Sorry, they, 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 yeah. they get confused sometimes. But then it's like, it's like the song, you know. Then you go and spoil it all by saying something stupid like "Chucky our law." Or cheer the IRA okay. at the Ardesh. and that's that's the problem. We and are going to have music later. And that's way. that's <laughs> but that's where the middle ground will not but come and support Sinn Féin because, because there's constant harking back to that utterly disgraceful campaign of violence that lasted. In but the there has to come a long. point in Irish politics where both main traditional parties acknowledge that there are a large number of people who vote for Sinn Féin. There are a large number of Sinn Féin deputies in the House. There are 23. You have what 45. Fine Gael at 50. So you cannot forevermore say we're not doing business with Sinn Féin because it's not really democratically legitimate to say that. Like on I what I basis I you, you, you two I respectfully... I gave my reasons earlier, Fianna, yeah, in, like in, in terms policy. of the tax, the so tax what the, policies. What does, what does it take to accept them? Is it the past or is it policy? Oh, oh, both. It's, 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 it's a legacy. Like I mean, Mary Lou herself uh, has said that Slab Murphy, uh, you know, and, and don't quote me on this, even though good I'm re good Republican was, a, was an honourable person or, 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 or a very nice person um, yeah, or something like that. And, and then we, we only have to look at, you know, the, 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 the issues that have gone on in Sinn Féin. So many public representatives have left over the last number of years. Um, he wants to get rid of the special criminal court. Very I recently. talked about the tax. Uh, it, w it, w it, w it would radically affect this country in a very adverse but let's way. Say, let's so say, Fine Gael is say never say going to be in a position, like and, and I'm very, very Kevin sure Humphreys about is here sitting in the front row, and you know, the Fine Gael or the, the Sinn Féin, is the reason my disagreement, the Sinn Féin pre-budget submission last time was almost indistinguishable from what we've seen for the Labour Party in recent years. It's almost a social democratic platform now, and there are, in policy terms, Thomas, huge similarities at times between their position and your position. We, 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 we can't and won't go into coalition with a party where the leader says, Chucky, our law, at the end of the speech, a slogan that was inextricably associated with the IRA campaign and the North I, 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 oh. Hold your horses yeah. there. Hold your horses there for one minute because that intervention from the floor gives me the opportunity to say we do actually want some, um, some interventions from the floor and I don't think we're going to resolve the uh, Sinn Féin and government issue No, but today. can I just, before but we go to the floor here, okay, can I just make please. a very, very brief sure. point? Uh, Sinn Féin has supporters and voters on both sides of this border. And the two people sitting beside me are going to have to realise it is disrespectful to them in the extreme, the way that they speak about the party that they have chosen to represent them. And I think, you know, there, there sounds a note of panic. You talk about Mary Lou and then you, you, hear, you hear the note of panic coming from the two of them. You know, but really, you've got to think long and hard. People have given us a mandate. We respect that and we it's use that utterly mandate. disrespectful, utterly disrespectful to use the phrase Chucky our law in front of an audience of the people of the island of Ireland and what certain people have Did to you suffer listen to over what many Mary years. Lou MacDonald said it's utterly disgraceful and disreputable to, to cheer on the IRA at the Ardesh as if well. If you listened to every word of it, Thomas, you would have heard that Mary Lou spoke about the need for reconciliation. She spoke about the need for a shared prosperity on okay. this island. And then she okay, the point there. We're, we're going to leave it there. I, I actually do want to bring in, Ke we have a roving mic here. I, I want to bring in Kevin Humphreys there because, Kevin, I want to ask you, how does it feel not to be up here among the three largest parties in the state, given that Labour was always one of the three largest parties in the state up until a few short years ago. Well, I have to say it's very disappointing not to be up there, and certainly the, the election results were di very disappointing uh, for Labour in the last election, and we accept that. But what we have at the moment is a conference of ploy, and no disrespect to Thomas, <coughs> is that we have a coalition government 
uh, with Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, with Fianna Fáil taking responsibility for the good decisions and walking away from all the hard decisions. Um, if you listen closely, and I have been listening very closely and attentive, Thomas has said he won't go into coalition with Fine Gael at the next election. Uh, the opinion polls, we won't see a huge change before the next election, so you'll either have a Fianna Fáil Taoiseach supported by Fine Gael or a Fine Gael Taoiseach supported by Fianna Fáil, and that's the likely outcome as Thomas is portraying it. Thomas is not going to take responsibility for uh, any of the tough decisions unless the leader of Fianna Fáil is the teacher of the country. And that's what you've said, Thomas. If you get down to it, no, that's exactly that's what that's said. absolutely not the case because clearly there's been a lot of points of pressure on Fianna Fáil over the last number of years. But you know, after the election, we could have run and gone back to the people and not supported a government like Labour did. Labour said, we're not getting involved in this. I mean, that was an abdication of responsibility as well because we felt that every TD in Dahl Aaron had a responsibility. But if Sinn Féin are saying next election they will, get they will be involved in it, then what, 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 how, where do you stand on that? If they're saying, we want to talk to you, and you won't talk well to we're not gonna we're, we're, we're not going so to was talk. Was that not hypocritical to say, you know? I think it's more than a little bit hypocritical, we, 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 to be honest, we, 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 to say we, 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 we it talks every TD, except some TDs, but every TD, we had the votes. We had the votes where Micheál Martin was possibly in a position to become teacher. And unfortunately, nobody, uh, apart from Fianna Fáil TD, supported him. There were two independents, I believe, did give some indication, and you'd be surprised to say who they were, but they didn't give any commitment, it has to be said, an indication. And nobody else, absolutely nobody else, Sinn Féin sat in their hands or, or voted against yeah. Micheál Martin, which allowed Enda Kenny uh, get into power as well. So, you know, and but nobody can stop who Sinn Féin would vote for in a Taoiseach election. That's, that's not something with the Thomas, Thomas, Thomas that's, that's fine in the past. What we're talking about is formation of future governments, uh, probably for the next 5, 10 or 15 years. And with two major parties saying this, we won't go into government with each other, uh, you're going to look at some sort of confidence supply uh, after which every election. Uh, which is not an uncommon system in various parliamentary democracies in Western Europe. It just isn't. Like I mean, it's, just, it's not the way things have been done up to now. There was a lot of research done in relation to how confidence supply operates in other countries as we were negotiating it. And it took some time to negotiate because it was so new and so novel. And probably there are things we do differently in terms of negotiations of that. But we have achieved, fundamentally, we have achieved many policies that we wanted, that our yeah, voters wanted. Briefly, and then we'll go to somebody else in the, the audience. The funny thing is that the, 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 the situation Kevin describes might actually suit Kevin's party quite well. Because let's say that the polls tighten somewhat and you know there are only three or four seats between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael and they come back after the next session and the Labour Party, uh, let's take it, nobody's going to talk to Sinn Féin, the Labour Party comes back with 7, 8, 9, 10. Then suddenly the Labour Party are the absolute kingmakers. There's three seats between the two parties. Whoever Brendan Howland says, I'm going to talk to you or you, the momentum is with those, that party and they can form a government. So, and Eamon Ryan is here as well and Micheál Martin's objective is to form a centre-left coalition minority or otherwise with Kevin and Eamon and others. And Labour could be in quite an influential position if the Okay, and since you asked that, and we will also give the opportunity to people who, who aren't elected politicians who are in the audience, but seeing as Faith makes that point, could we give the mic to Eamon? I can't see a thing out there in the dark, but if we give the mic to Eamon to get his thought on that potential centre-left coalition, which we might see after the, after the next election. Um, we, w as a party, will talk to everyone and wouldn't rule out anything. And I'll be perfectly honest, I was listening here and I thought to myself, I like our current doll, I like our politics. When I look at one side of us, we have an American president who wants to arm their, their school teachers to stop mass shootings. On the other side, we have a government that couldn't tell you whether it's Thursday or Wednesday on the <laughs> in Britain. And God help us, the poor Germans have spent six months and, they don't, and they're nowhere near forming a government, so we're not that bad. Uh, and I think this doll has been good in some ways in terms of it allows us to approach the repeal of the aid referendum in a more consensual manner. It allowed us to do the Brexit talks in a more united manner. And sometimes that we actually get to talk about real policy things around housing and environment and education and health and, and transport and things that matter. So I like our parliament. I'd have to say one of the one things I don't, well, a few things I don't like, but one thing I slightly dislike when I'm looking around and I'm, I'm sitting up at the top looking down, this ring, this three-way fight constantly where Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin and Fianna Gael are mocking each other and obsessed on nothing else other than giving a good kick to one or the other and sometimes using how they deal with one or the other to kick the other. <laughs> It's slightly, it's not the real story of where we, what we need to be thinking about and using our time about. I, I think uh, there's lots of us things where we need to think and look forward. Who's going to go into bed with who is not the first priority in my mind at the moment. Fair enough. Um, somebody else in the audience? Uh, we'll get a mic to you straight away. Anybody else? No, they're quiet down the back. Oh, there's somebody. Yeah. Hi, I'm just going to 
public hunter. Um, I'm really disappointed in the discussion. It has all been about party politics. I came here looking forward to a discussion about politics and society, policies in society. And I recently saw the Hottie Gregory play and I thought I was thinking, here we are again. We're back where we were then. And I have a question <laughs> for you. I'm thinking of the country and the good of the nation rather than party. Is there any reason why, I've been toying in my own head recently, why can't I join two political parties? Now, I'm not referring to any of the parties up there on the stage, but two parties who maybe have the main thrust in common, maybe a different of emphasis. I had hoped or thought that maybe Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil were the only two parties who have so much in common, but you dare not vote uh, for both of them. You can only choose. So I'm just putting that question out there because I'm, I'm not happy with the way politics is going. The question moment. is to, to join two political parties or to what, vote for two yeah, political what, parties? Yeah, I'm looking for an answer. Okay. And I brought it up at a recent discussion. Why could a, an individual not join two parties who are very similar in their aims? I think that would be up to the political parties because they have their own internal rules, which I suspect might uh, make that impossible. Mr. Stephen? Yeah, no, I, I just struck there when you, when you mentioned, um, thank you for your contribution, when you mentioned Hahi. And uh, my father, uh, which is public knowledge, was a, was a Fianna Fáil councillor um, and then an independent councillor and, uh, before he died. And I am a Fianna Gael um, party member, as you know. And one of the reasons why I joined Fianna Gael was because of its integrity and because over many, many years, we have always cleaned up the mess, unfortunately. Uh, that was left behind from Fianna Fáil. And um, I, I, I hope that you will find um, some succor in, in, in Fianna Gael in terms of the confidence that we can give you in our integrity as a party and that we are actually, and certainly I am, and I know that the Taoiseach is, and all of this government um, is trying to do its best for this country. And I hope that we restore your faith in that. Can I bounce the question onto you, Fiac, as well? Because it's a criticism of the, of the political commentary at classes that we focus too much on, when I say we, I mean you, actually, that you focus, you focus too much on the, what's called horse race politics, who's up, who's down, it's all about the next election, and it's not about issues that actually affect oh people. I disagree, I disagree, like we cover issues day after day after day. Like when was the last story you've seen in the Irish Times about potential coalition options? It flares up about once every month as an issue. The vast majority of our time is spent covering the issues today in, in Parliament or Government, be it the eight, be it policy issues like health and housing, it just so happens to be the thing that people talk about the most when they're around Leicester House in private. And I'm not like, you know, people talk about policy issues, but when you get politicos together, that's what they talk about, largely speaking. But we do not obsess about coalitionology to the detriment of all other issues. That is not correct. And I think, you know, a basic assessment of the output of political journalism generally would bear that out. Another question, if there is one. Well, I'm going to be cheeky and a question and you know, comment. Um, uh, whatever about general commentary from the media this evening has been entirely about uh, the coalition discussion and I think it's been somewhat disappointing. We've got three extremely accomplished politicians on the stage and we've got two, at least two, very accomplished politicians in the audience uh, and there was much policy discussion that could have been engaged in uh, but it was let slide for the sake of the, um, the game, um, which uh, I think a lot of people here will find disappointing. But I actually do have a, do have a serious question, um, which is if uh, the three politicians were right now in checkers and not given the option to say, I resign, what would you do if you were in Theresa May's position? Hmm. I'll, I'll ask Louise first, because I, like, I love the idea of you being in checkers, Louise. <laughs> I don't even know where it is, you, to be honest with you. <laughs> Um, if I were in Theresa May's position, um, I think I would recognise the reality that what is best for uh, the North is special status. I think I would come out firmly uh, in favour of that. Uh, I think that that would be the responsible thing to do. I think I would make clear commitments about uh, remaining uh, within the... Um, within the structures of the European Union to the greatest extent possible. And I think I would recognize the fact that there is a land border uh, on this island, you know, and, and I, I actually, and I, I genuinely believe this, I think when people in uh, Britain voted on the issue of Brexit, I don't believe that the issue of a land border was, was in their mind at all. And I, I see, if I were to transport myself into uh, Theresa May's 
um, position, I think what I would do would be move quickly and swiftly uh, to protect the, the North okay. and to, uh, to bring about so, special so, so status. So, Thomas, you're there having afternoon tea with Jacob Rees-Mogg, and, <laughs> and what do you say to him? I couldn't say what I'd say to him <laughs> here on the stage, <laughs> to be honest, which is two words, to be honest. I mean, the, the, the truth is, the truth is that the, the general mass of opinion in the House of Commons is very sensible and very reasonable towards Brexit and towards the North of Ireland and supports a Good Friday Agreement, probably wants to stay in the single market. And unfortunately, because of the way the Tory party is set up and the House of Commons is set up and has been, unfortunately, for, for forever and a day, uh, the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg and some of his and Boris Johnson, etc., who's more of an opportunist than an ideologue, I suppose, uh, they have they have the say. And I think Theresa May needs to be brave. I think, you know, what has worked in politics and really works is when you just what is the right thing to do, and try and discern that yourself and do it. And I I, I think that's what she should do. And I think it's an approach to policy making that we've been forced to adopt just on the on minor issues and on day to day issues in the doll. What, because you know, when you're in opposition the way we are in a conference supply agreement, you can't just oppose everything. You have to take every single issue really, really seriously and say, right, what would we do if we were in government uh, or what would we not do if we were in government? And that's actually forms the basis of a decision. And I she has to do the I right thing on this major issue. What the history, question means history will, is will that, I, I mean, I think, you know, all the representatives here would like to see Theresa May either you know, back out of Brexit or have a very the softest Brexit possible. But given the political circumstances that she finds herself with her own party within the country, what would you do? Well, there's sort of two parts to your question. I think the, the first thing on a human level, I think, um, I don't know if anyone here has read Tim Shipman's books, uh, All Out War and Fallout. If you want an inside track into Brexit and what Theresa May has had to deal with on a human level, uh, I think it was the fact it was her husband who, who convinced her to, to, to stay after the last election. And she's had inordinately difficult um, brief, if you like, in, in the role that she's taken on, unprecedented um, in, in that country. So at a human level, I, I have absolute compassion for what she's trying to do. And of course, in politics, as you know, and, and these two politicians beside me know more than, than anybody else, you're not just dealing with your own um, issues on a daily basis, you're dealing with constituency issues as well, and also internally in your own party. That's always going to be the way. Um, but Theresa May has to build her alliances, keep her alliances there, obviously in terms of regulatory alignment and Brexit, we, we all know the, the, the situation around that. And, we, you know, as, as far as Ireland is concerned, we just want to make sure that we're, we're looked after as best as we can be. That's ultimately the goal. Yeah. Um, I see a watch being tapped from my colleague, Mr. McGee, in the corner, because he has, uh, he, uh, we, we have the next element of this, uh, of this fantastic evening, which he's arranged, about to come up. So uh, I'm going to thank our guests uh, this evening for, for this element, for to, to Tifa, to Thomas, and to Louise, and to Fiat for joining us. And thank you very much for your contributions as well.